Howdy. <laughs> <laughs> so are we going to start right on off with the questions, or do you guys want to, like, give an overview, or how's this going to uh, work? So I guess maybe we could just start out with, uh, you know, what is this about? Um, so we're all being forced to work from home. So this wasn't voluntary, right? We, we all, if there was a sudden shock that this occurred. And um, this brings up a, a, a good question of whether or not it makes sense to work from home when, once we're able to work from work again. Um, and there's two sort of competing ideas. One is, is that there's studies on working from home and then there's also benefits to, to location. So um, it's a complex question. Uh, yeah, so do you want me to start with the questions then? Yeah, go ahead. So as the majority of our nation is currently working from home, as you said, when the two competing theories exist, so do you believe overall though that this has increased or decreased uh, our overall productivity and why? So um, I'll just talk about this first and, and then Dusty is probably gonna tell me I'm wrong. Um, and uh, so the, the answer to this is in my mind is, is this de definitively it is less productive and the reason I believe this is I can actually show you some charts to, to actually help this out. So I didn't, don't worry, I didn't make slides, but I did make three slides just so I could show you some graphs. And, um, and so I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, and what I'm going to show you is, here we go. All right. So um, you guys see this? Uh, uh, slides right here. Yes. 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 Okay. So um, it's three basic facts. Um, and this is, I picked it out of three different papers, but this is something that's pretty consistent in all kinds of different uh, research around cities is that density matters and it matters a lot. And so um, this one is simply a look at the real GDP per capita. Um, it's essentially pricing adjusted. And um, what you have is on the x-axis, you have the actual number of people in it. Um, but on the, the y-axis, you have that per capita uh, production. Um, and you'll note that as the city gets bigger, it's not only that the city is actually producing more, it's producing more per person. It's doing it in real terms. Um, it also matters even how much land you're on. So um, if you look at the density of cities and you take the median density and you split them and you look at the high dense cities versus the low dense cities, what you see is, is that the high dense cities earn more per capita than those same low dense cities. Um, and this is, it doesn't even matter whether or not you're talking about those who have lots of education versus little education. They actually have this broken out in this particular um, And so even just the density matters. And then of course, as you get into more educated people, um, not only do people make more money because they're educated, they make more money because other people around them are educated. So this here is a set of charts. This, we're looking at the um, labor participation rate in comparison to the percentage of the population in a given city that actually has a bachelor's degree. And this data is from the 1980s, but also 2000. And you see exactly the same pattern is that as that percentage of the population has more education, it actually makes it so that essentially the unemployment goes down in those various cities. And you can also see it in mean wages and things like that. The only reasonable um, conclusion somebody could have here is, is that it, it, what happens is, is that by being densely located next to each other, it makes it so that people are more productive. And simply making people work from home is essentially negating a big proportion of the benefits from cities. And cities have such a huge benefit um, from, from these location factors. So to, the short answer to, to your question is, is I definitely think productivity is down. That doesn't mean that in all, in all industries or in all professions, working from home can't work. But overall, it seems like it should be down. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Sweet. Um, did uh, Dr. Dustin White have anything to say about that? Sorry, nice to meet you. I'm, I'm Brian, by the way. How you doing, Brian? I'm doing um, well. So, I mean, obviously we're being less productive right now, but I'm pretty sure that might have something to do with why we're at home. 
um, <laughs> you know, when, when we look at people who are working from home, um, usually we don't look at it in the context of everyone isolating and not being able to go anywhere. Like if I was working from home, I would still be able to get coffee or like meet up with people. And even a lot of that has been taken away from us right now. So, you know, what, what working from home means today is a little bit different than what working from home means generally. Right. But, um, one of the things that, um, that I've talked to Dr. Smith about before, uh, is the fact that as technology improves, um, we can be, we can be proximate to each other without actually being physically present. And so, uh, this is some of the work that I've done has been to research, um, basically the change is for people who work from home over time, right? So if you think about people in the 80s, right, uh, it would have been really hard to work from home. Like you could have done it, maybe, uh, but a lot of the resources you rely on to work from outside of us are, are things that were built recently, right? I mean, uh, you youngins might not remember this, but Gmail's only been around since like 2003 or four. Uh, and you know, before that email was patchy at best. And if you go back even further than that, most people didn't really have internet. And so being able to communicate rapidly and share documents, share information beyond like, um, you know, this is what I did today was really, really difficult in the past. And so when we look at this time trend, uh, we see that there were huge, um, huge gaps between the amount of earn that you could have as someone who worked from home in like the 80s and 90s and uh, that rapidly jumped as you got into the 2000s and internet started to penetrate the country right so we actually had internet connections across more of the country and what that tells us is that people can be more productive working from home right that wage gap declined that means that a firm who's hiring people who do work from home starts to say you know what the people who are working from home are more and more like the people who are working in the office because they're able to be more fully integrated into the work environment without actually being there. And in today's world, it's actually really easy. Uh, we have all sorts of technology now, right? I mean, we have, here we are on a Zoom meeting as if we were in the same room. Um, if you ever work on data projects, uh, there are cloud servers, there's GitHub for sharing code, uh, are so many different resources for us to use. Uh, I mean, honestly, we can even go into like Google's collaboratory and we can start writing the same Python notebook at the same time. So we can be doing a data project at the same time on the same data, all from wherever we feel like being. And that really changes our ability to uh, be productive remotely. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that it's exactly like being in the office. Like yesterday, I had office hours for my programming class. And let me tell you, it's a heck of a lot easier to move a cursor and point someone's error out than it is to try and describe it with words. And so, obviously, we can, we can be more or less productive um, depending on the task. But there's so much that's fairly trivial at this point to remotely, right? I don't know if you guys have ever worked on a Google Doc uh, with other people from different, you know, at at different locations, but it's really not that different from sitting next to them with your computers out writing the same document. And so uh, over time, we've really had uh, the ability to improve our, uh, our productivity working from home. And one of the really cool things about this that I think is, uh, so this is me geeking, about my, geeking out about my own research, but um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, principal agent problems in your, uh, in your classes. Does that ring a bell? Not for me, at least. So real quick summary of principal agent problems. Uh, you can think about them as like uh, the farmer and farm hand problem, right? I'm a farmer. I can't be everywhere on my farm all the time. And I'm going to hire people to work on my farm because I can't be everywhere. I can't do enough to get, get it all done. So I hire people. Uh, now, what I don't know is what they're all doing all day, right? They come back dirty and sweaty at the end of the day, but that could be because they, you know, jogged a little bit at the end and rolled in the dirt, or it could be because they actually worked all day. And so, you know, I see that they look like they worked, but that's all I, that's all I have to go off of, right? Until we get to the point where we're actually harvesting. And if the yield is the same as when I was working alone, uh, that, that starts to indicate that maybe they weren't trying that hard. And so a principal agent problem basically says, 
I can't monitor the work you do. So what I'm going to do is pay you based on output instead. And so you can think about this. This is why uh, salespeople are paid on commission, right? Because we can't tell how hard a salesperson's working. And so they get paid based on commission. Well, when you look at the gap in pay between people who worked from home and people who work uh, in the office back in the day, you would see that there was a whole lot more volatility in pay for people who worked from home. Basically, they were being paid commission. And so you'd have some people who are high earners, right, really productive, and people who were low earners. Now, that's either because they're not productive or because they had bad luck, right? Because you could, you could try really hard to be a salesperson, and if you're working your butt off, sometimes you still don't sell anything. And so in that context, uh, you would expect to have really volatile wages. But as it becomes easier and easier for us to monitor work, so now we can see how many times you commit things to GitHub, we can see the changes you make to a Word document, we can see whether or not you show up for the Zoom meeting, we know whether or not you're working all day. And because of that, we don't have to pay based on commission anymore. And so we actually see that all of this technology has made it easier for employers to actually monitor employees working outside of the office. And so not only is it easier to be productive outside of the office, it's also easier to manage people outside of the office. And so we're really coming to this sweet spot in remote working where uh, it looks a lot like working from the office uh, in pretty much every way. And on top of that, uh, the business doesn't have to pay for office space, which is, you know, a non-trivial cost. I, ben, do you remember how much it costs per person for, have you seen those statistics? I can't remember. Well, off space statistic, no, I do not remember those offhand, sorry. Oh. It's like, it's like a few, th I mean, it's, it's multiple thousands of dollars a year per person uh, in terms of like having space for someone in the office. And so, you know, if you can let people work from home and they're pretty much as productive as they would be in the office, uh, you end up with, um, with a lot of savings by having them work from space they already have. So what you're saying is you think overall productivity is going down, but as technology improves, we're going to get closer to where we are when we have like when we're physically agglomerated with each other. I mean, so, so based on wages, we see that there's, if anything, there's a wage premium to people who work from home controlling for everything we can reasonably control for. Uh, now that doesn't mean we've accounted for everything. There's probably stuff we're missing, but given the data we have, we can't find what explains the difference between uh, people who work from home and work in the office, aside from the fact that uh, they work from home which means that it must just be cost savings benefiting firms because we actually see people working from home being paid more than people who work in the office uh, as of 2014. Interesting. So on a related note for another question, uh, Dr. Smith emailed me a general overview of what we're going to talk about today. And he said in, in some guy named Dusty's report on working from home, even though it was only measuring like simple, easy, easy, is that your report? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it, even though you're measuring simple, easy to measure jobs, uh, what made it easy? What made it more efficient to work from home overall? Um, so we, we measured every job we could measure. Um, we, we did this. Uh, so we used the American Community Survey study, or I did. This was me on my own. It was really boring to work on my own. Uh, but um, there are like 900 job codes, I think, and about the same number of industry codes in the American Community Survey. And so uh, at one point I controlled for all of them, which was bad. It takes forever to run that model. I don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> but uh, given that we control for all of that, we know that it, it's not about what job you're doing. It's about the fact that you're, you're working from home that drives these differences. Mm, I see. So. And, and what I was actually saying in the email was, as I was making a more general statement, there's a, a some there's additional papers that are on working from home, and they are consistently finding um, that there is some premium to it. Um, but it, this isn't a slight to the research; it's just a matter of how research works. Intrinsically, they are all doing things that deal with jobs in which the output is measurable um, when they are looking at productivity. And so, like, for instance, one paper, this is not Dusty's paper. There was one paper that's looking at uh, service call workers. And that's because they can actually measure the output of the service call worker, call worker. So imagine if you wanted to do, like, a randomized trial of working from home, but you tried to do it with professors. Like, you couldn't do it. You couldn't measure the output. So it's simply a, a matter of how research is conducted that you end up in a situation where you're measuring, well, very measurable jobs which means that they also tend to be the less creative ones. 
Yeah, and and that's that's why that's why I chose to use wage instead because I'm not directly measuring productivity, but I'm basically measuring what firms think of your productivity, right? They're paying you, and there's other stuff that goes into wage, right? Like there's scarcity of the of the type of job and all that kind of stuff, but you know, companies pay you based on what your work is worth, and so it allowed me to look at a few more occupations than just the ones that are easily measured, but. Ben's totally right. Like it's, it's really hard to measure this because either you're using a proxy like I did, or you're stuck looking at a, a very small subset of, of workers to try and measure this kind of stuff. So personally though, do you guys feel more efficient online or working in like your classroom settings? Like for, are you talking about te teaching or research? Cause um, both. Okay. Ben, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I, I would argue that I, I am not as efficient when it comes to research at home versus in person. Um, it's part of that has to do with the fact that I am not the only person working from home from my home at the moment. And so I have dueling Zoom calls sometimes uh, going on in a given day. Um, but that is something that, as Dusty pointed out, that's somewhat unique to the current situation. That probably would not be like a um, a common situation with somebody working from home, a very low percentage of the population prior to COVID, um, worked from home on a, on a, a regular basis. Um, and teaching, I would say it's probably a wash. I, I, can't, I can't quite figure out whether it's more or less efficient um, than going into the office or, or that such. Now, I, I do suspect it's less efficient in the sense of learning outcomes because there's a long set of literature out there on the difference in learning outcomes among students between online classes and in-person classes. And the short version of it is that on cl online classes simply don't teach you as much, given everything else is the same. Yeah, and I, I agree. Uh, I have a two-year-old coworker who likes to steal my glasses while I'm at home, so that makes it harder to work. Um, but yeah, I, I think that in terms of research, uh, one of the advantages of, of being in the office for me is that uh, I, I go and bug my coworkers all the time and I ask them random questions about what I'm doing. And yeah, I can do that through Slack or through Hangouts, uh, but the kind, of, the kind of conversations that come up because of that don't really happen as organically through, uh, through chats, at least for me. But, um, you know, what we tend to do is send more gifts of, of angry cats and stuff like that than actual useful stuff. Uh, but I, I that were I better trained at working from home or did I, if I had more experience, it would probably start to approach the same level of productivity. Um, and again, it might just be that I'm cooped up and I want to do weird things, make myself not as stressed. So I send weird cat pictures. Uh, but um, I, I think that it is slightly more productive to interact with people in person. And that, that might just be me. Uh, I think other people have different preferences, but I, I do enjoy the, the in-person interactions in terms of uh, research. Uh, for, um, for teaching, uh, I definitely think that, um, that in-person is more effective for me. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's unfair to judge by what's happening right now, because what we have is a bunch of people who chose to take in-person classes, all of a sudden being forced into online classes. So everybody who wanted in-person classes now no longer get and so that means the students are probably frustrated because they didn't want to be in an online class or they would have registered for one. Uh, and now we're trying to make them learn online in a way that they probably thought they didn't learn as well. And so it might just be kind of compounding problems in that sense. Uh, but it does seem to be a little bit harder to make everything work online. Uh, and it might just be unique to the way that everyone ended up online this time. I would actually point out that part of what Dusty just said as part, as part of his answer, it hits on one of the, the things that is studied in urban economics um, pretty heavily, this idea of just randomly getting information from each other. So Dusty's example of just bugging his coworkers, that, that's, that's formalized, we call that information spillovers. And um, it is one of the reasons that urban economists believe, and we have data to back this up, that having urban centers and having people closely um, next to each other makes positive impacts. I mean, 
you can imagine it with just a, an idea of like a, a single solitary educated person at a firm of uneducated people. That single solitary educated person simply by being there and being in close proximity to those other people becomes a resource mm -hmm. in, um, for those other people to essentially go bug for, for them to help them with whatever. Right. So that, that's actually more, more the formalized version of what Dusty's talking about. And some companies actually make a point of, of building their buildings in ways to make it so that these collisions, that's what they're called, um, occur organically. So in some buildings, they make it so that you have to go through these choke points. And that is purposely designed so that people have to interact with one, each other, with one another as they go to their offices or wherever. I see. You, you can think about that. Um, you know, so uh, Dr. Smith lives in Exarbin. Uh, I live in Elkhorn. I bet he runs into more people just in general than I do, right? I see my neighbors sometimes. Like, I think I know their names. Um, Dr. Smith probably runs into a lot of people a lot of times and has interactions with them, right, that I don't. And so in terms of getting new ideas from the people we bump into, part of that is bumping into people, right? You know, this is also why uh, people are not getting COVID-19 in Western Nebraska probably as quickly as they are in Omaha or in New York City, because they just don't even bump into people, right? But in the same sense where you might bump into people and get something bad, uh, when there's not diseases wandering around, uh, there's a lot of good stuff from bumping into people because you bump into them and you learn from them. You bump into them, you get new ideas. And that happens through that density that Dr. Smith was talking about. Um, all right, sweet. So I got, I got a pretty, pretty important question right here. So recently I read an article from the Harvard School of Public Health that said that we may have to endure social distancing guidelines until 2022 unless some breakthrough is made in therapeutics or a vaccine is made. If this were to be true and everyone had to work from home for almost two more years, what changes could we see in the job market and like what effects on the economy might this have? Uh, my, my guess is that this is going to look... Um, I think it's going to look a lot like the recovery from the last recession. Uh, a lot of jobs that uh, people used to do are going to be abstracted away. Uh, a lot of, I think that a lot of the things that were, were slowly being eliminated from, from the economy will be eliminated more quickly because they have to be while we work from home. Uh, and I think that a lot of jobs just won't come back. Uh, and so what that means is that we need to have ways to retrain people for the jobs that'll be around, right? Uh, so there, there'll be jobs, right? But there'll be different jobs, just like they were, um, if, you, if you look at, um, at who got hired again after, uh, after the last recession, uh, the jobs that were popping into being after the recession were very different than the ones that vanished beforehand. And that means that people have to be retrained if they want to uh, move into the next cycle of the economy. Uh, and so I think that we'll see some of that and it's going to be really painful, I think, but um, it, I think that we have to be ready for the fact that a lot of things are going to happen. Uh, we're going to realize that we don't have to always have physical space for everything, uh, that a lot of things can be done remotely or can be done, um, you know, in, in different ways. And that's going to change. And I, I don't know exactly how it'll play out because we're still trying to figure out the best way to do everything right now. Uh, but I think there will be a lot of different kinds of jobs uh, than there were before. Do you think a lot of these jobs would be based on like working from home and like Zoom technology? And yeah, I mean, I think that there will be a lot more uh, like technology focused jobs because, you know, obviously technology is what's facilitating uh, us being able to do things right now. And so, you know, we'll we'll emphasize the kinds of tools that lead us to greater productivity and we'll uh, we'll get rid of a lot of stuff that doesn't seem to help anymore. I, I always say I'm not a macroeconomist. I don't even play one on TV. So um, I cannot predict the, the future on what's going to happen. I, I think we all agree it's going to be bad. Um, but I do think I agree with Dr. White that there is going to be a change in the mix of jobs that exist. And so... The way I think about it is, is it's more important than ever to be educated and to be able to have your job be something that you can do from home. Um, 
I might disagree a little bit on how productive you'll be in comparison to it in the office, but you'll definitely be better off having that education and being able to, you know, work from home and do 95 to 98% of your job as well as you would have been able to do it in the office compared to not being able to do it at all. I see. Yep. <laughs> so referencing that same scenario of us having to stay like home working from home until 2022, if agglomeration is discouraged for that long, what effect would this have specifically on entrepreneurs? Because agglomeration really helps entrepreneurs, I, I think. And then, uh, yeah, the economy in general, but you already answered that one. So um, I can say that if you were to, to um, make it so that essentially you have forced dispersion and cities no longer play the role that they historically have had in economic growth, um, long run, that will actually just make the recovery harder. Um, and, and the way I kind of think about this as a proxy is you can think about these large urban centers as being that they're dense and they got entrepreneurs in them, they got educated people in them, and they're all densely populated, they tend to grow faster. And so when you have a recession or something like that, they essentially come rocketing right out of that recession and they've got a lot of growth and they pull along a lot of people with them and people move to those city centers, et cetera. Essentially what you've done is you've taken a city like New York or a city, you know, city like LA or, or even Omaha, and you've made those cities kind of like, you know, Kearney, Nebraska. Like you've, you've, turned, you've turned Omaha into, you know, 25 or whatever the multiplier is, Kearney, Nebraska is in which they don't have those same benefits to the fact that everything is closely located. And so what that's going to end up doing is it's going to make the growth rate of big cities look a lot like the growth rate of little cities. And as I showed you at the beginning, there's a difference, right? The rate at which you are going to be able to produce goods is directly related to your density. And if you're le effectively less dense because of the, um, the social distancing in place, that's going to make it so that the economic growth is going to end up being lower across the country. One thing I would add to that is um, I think that it, it will also be the kind of case where people who are well connected will become even better connected. Because if you already know people and you interact with them and you have a large you know, social network, uh, then you're going to be able to bump into those people digitally, right? So if you already know people, you'll be able to connect with them digitally. You'll be able to converse with them. They'll be able to introduce you to other people. And so I think it'll be less painful for those connected people. And I think what will happen is that people who aren't connected and integrated into those kinds of networks will just struggle even more to uh, find those interactions that allow them to thrive in a, in a remote type environment. So I'm in econometrics right now, and pretty much the whole course is based around the question, who becomes an entrepreneur? Like, how hard do you think the rate of entrepreneurship is going to get affected by this whole virus? Since those support networks of, like, multiple entrepreneurs helping each other succeed isn't going to be there anymore, really. I mean, that goes far beyond the issues related to, um, you know, density it, it go, or working from home. It goes to... What's demand going to be like when we, we leave the situation? It's going to be how available are funds from banks? I mean, there's a lot of issues that we don't really know the answer to right now. Um, but in the very short run, it's clearly going to be pretty hard. Um, and it's from all of those factors. All right, sweet. And Luis has a question also. He just DM'd me, so uh, I think he wants to ask it too. Um, if you'll unmute his microphone. Oh, I have to unmute him? Sorry. Sorry, yeah, no, I got it. I got it. So, sorry. so um, yeah, so my question uh, is essentially, uh, I, I kind of like, I'm kind of like seeing if I can ask some questions over the statistics you originally showed at the beginning that, uh, that showed uh, that denser areas tend to have more productivity per capita. Um, so my question essentially is whether, um, whether there's like a, I guess a causation correlation issue here. So like, um, how can we be sure that the, the, the higher incomes in these denser areas per capita are at like the factors that, 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 that cause those um, higher incomes is the, the working in the work workplace and not just like maybe worker competition. Cause for example, if I live in Miami, 
um, and I'm working from home, I may still be competing with other workers and I may have more of an incentive to be more productive since I don't want to lose my job. So, I mean, how can we be sure that it is the, the, the fact that they are working at the workplace and not the fact that there's more competition in denser areas? How can we be sure that that's the, necessarily the causation and, not, and they're, just not, they're not just correlated? Yeah, no, absolutely. You have a great question. Um, and, uh, and that's oftentimes people think, well, it must be just simply the case that um, the people who are working in, say, Silicon Valley and getting paid larger sums of money, they must just be compensating for cost of living issues or things like that. The sort of the reason why we, we know it's more than that is because we know that firms are purposely locating themselves into locations in which they're paying higher wages where there is a pool of workers. So people purposely, if you're in the software industry, locate themselves in Silicon Valley. They, they voluntarily do that um, because they know that they're actually more productive and it's makes up for the fact that they um, have, it makes up for the fact that they're having to pay higher wages per person. And you can think about the choice that a software company might make if it was simply a matter of paying a higher wage. They would might locate themselves into another location entirely, maybe another city, but maybe not one as densely packed. Um, and they would be able to essentially hire those workers for less money and get the same output. But they found that they can't do that. Um, the other way that we know that that's not the entirety of the story of just cost of living issues is, is that we can actually look at on some specific industries, mostly manufacturing, we can look at output levels. And so we know that the output levels actually make it so that they are more profitable in those denser packed cities um, and they're actually able to, to earn more and, and make up for the fact that they're paying higher wages. Thank you. That, 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 that's, that's a really insightful response to my question. All right, I got one on unemployment now. So as you probably know, 17 million Americans have filed for unemployment within the last three weeks, according to CNN. So do you think we have reached the peak unemployment from this crisis? And if not, when do you think we will? I would repeat my statement that I'm not a macroeconomist and I don't play one on TV. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I am confident in saying that we are not near our peak. Um, because we're still in a quarantine, and until we're out of quarantine, we, we won't really know what, what happens. But beyond that, I cannot say how long it will take or anything like that. One of the things to think about, and again, I, I don't know what the right answer is to this either, uh, but I, I suspect strongly that we are not at the bottom yet. Um, and the reason I think that is because every time people lose their jobs, they are going to stop buying other stuff. And when they stop buying other stuff, that weakens demand for other things, which makes those firms start to lay other people off. And so until we get to the bottom of the cascade, which I don't know where that is, we're going to see a lot of people losing jobs because there's, you know, I mean, if, if you got lost your jobs and your parents lost your jobs, people would stop enrolling at UNO. And if people stop enrolling at UNO, you better believe that they're not just going to keep on paying us out of the goodness of their hearts to be faculty members. And we're going to probably end up on the chopping block, right? And so eventually, uh, these types of ripples end up going through the economy, but we don't know where they stop really, because all we know is that people aren't going to grocery stores right now, which is causing all sorts of crazy stuff, right? We're not, sh we're not doing any non-essential shopping, essentially. Uh, and already we've, we've had 17 million people laid off. And so what that looks like before it stops, we don't, we don't really know because this isn't something that we've experienced in the recent past. And so we, we just don't, we have no idea, but it is terrifying, <laughs> honestly. 17 million Americans is a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have a couple more questions, but Ian said they may have been covered by Dr. Fang last time, but I wasn't there for that meeting, so I don't know. Um, I keep seeing headlines about certain people, like I think Merkel of Germany, talking about reopening certain economies and other states talking about opening theirs, like New York. Um, when can we, ex when do you think, even though you're not master economists or play them on TV, when could you expect Nebraska to open its economy back up, in your opinions? That sounds like a great question for an epidemiologist. I agree with that statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, oh, I mean, I think they'll do it when they feel like the risks are low enough that they can afford to, to open businesses, right? I mean, when when you're choosing between dollars and people, it's usually a better choice to choose the people. Um, but at some point you get to the point where the risk does fall down, right? Enough people have uh, become immune because they've already been affected, infected, or we have some sort of uh, immunization or, you know, eventually something will change and it will make it so that it will be less costly to interact with other people and uh, have a, have whatever the new reduced risk of infection is. And we don't know, you know especially as economists, we really have no idea <laughs> what, what will lead to that or when it will happen. Uh, but those are the kinds of things to be looking for, right? Is when, um, when, when we get to the point where there's some way to reduce the risk of people dying because of the disease, that's probably when we'll start to see businesses open back up. All right, I got. I don't really know a lot about this topic, and I think you guys probably would know a little bit more about this as like an economist. Uh, what are your opinions on the three trillion dollar government stimulus pass like package? And what do you think its effects will be? I think that, so that was talked about by um, Dr. Fang and he is more qualified than, I'll say he's more qualified than me and Dustin can speak for himself um, the, to, to answer that question. So I, I can only go off of what, what he says and what other macroeconomists say. That said, obviously the only historical example we really have to work off of is the Great Depression and the idea of just pumping money through the system is, I mean, at a minimum, it's the only option we have. So there's that. <laughs> is that known as Keynesian economics, where you uh, start, the government starts putting more money into the economy? It, I mean, it's broader than that, but yes, that, that's the part of the idea of Keynesian economics. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of curious if they will start a new set of public works type stuff after this, because it would be a great way to update infrastructure and to basically smooth out all of the unemployment that we're about to experience, because the kinds of people who could do a good job in an infrastructure type project are probably the people who are going to be laid off first in this, in this type of recession, because they're the ones who can't work from home. Right. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm, I'm really curious to see if we get to the point of considering public works projects like we did after the depression. Um, but that that's more me being curious than knowing anything for real. Because again, like Dr. Smith said, uh, Dr. Fang is probably much more informed on this than we are. So, uh, Do uh, Dr. Smith, you have to leave at 2.45, right? Yep. So, uh, should I wrap it up with, like, one more uh, sure. question? Yep. So, this isn't really for, well, yeah, I'll just ask it. Do you guys have any advice for how us college students can fiscally take advantage of the shock to the economy? Are you guys doing anything yourselves to try and, like, reap some rewards from the stock market dropping this low and the down and everything? <laughs> just a personal question here, really. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think that you can. I don't. I don't believe in market timing. I, I know that you know there's people who do, um, but there's quite a bit of literature that you can't really time market. So I don't really believe there's any advantage to trying to you know do something special in the stock market or something like that. Now, what you can do as a college student um, is a little bit different. Um, one of the things that happens in virtually every recession. So in this way, this is a recession that's not special in this one particular aspect is a lot of people tend to go get education during a recession. So um, I don't know how many students will do this, but if I were a student and I was looking at the job prospects and I was looking at the op option of, you know, getting a second major or going into graduate school directly, that would suddenly be a lot more attractive to me than it was three months ago, right? Because my opportunity cost is now a lot lower to getting that extra years of education. So I would actually be looking at how I can extend my, or add to my human capital right now, being that the job prospects are kind of bad. Um, so in that sense, um, yeah, but that's about all I can say that students really can do. Yeah, so for example, when I was an undergrad, um, so I was finishing up my undergrad uh, during the last recession and there were people, so I, I finished my undergrad uh, in, like three and a half or four years or whatever. 
uh, but there were people who were at my university who'd been there for six or seven years because they uh, just decided that it was not worth it to try and go into a job market where there were very few jobs. Uh, now, these were probably the dummies who I was interacting with because they were still in their undergrad instead of getting master's degrees or PhDs or stuff like that and actually getting human capital, right? Uh, they were just extending their undergrad. I don't recommend that. But I think like Dr. Smith said, you know, if, if the jobs you're applying to are few and far between and don't pay as much because everybody wants a job really badly and you can afford to go get more education instead, uh, it, it's a good time to do it because the job prospects just aren't there. And so you're not going to give up as many dollars of, of income to go and get a graduate degree during a recession. Do you think there's going to be a higher demand for economists uh, during this whole, uh, it's kind of like brand new, I don't think this has ever really happened before kind of thing with a disease kind of changing the way the economy is doing its thing, all, everyone going to online stuff, online Zoom technologies and stuff. So are, do you think there's going to be more demand for economists? I mean, tech companies are notorious for liking economists on their quantitative teams. Uh, so in that sense, maybe. Uh, but Honestly, I don't know that in the larger economy as a whole, it will change much for economists per se. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. I think yeah, economists are already in a pretty high demand as it is. And so, but there's nothing special about the situation that would make economists more attractive in the same way that like an epidemiologist is obviously in high demand at the moment. But that might go away when there's no longer interesting disease problems. So. All righty. Well, thank you guys for answering all these questions. Thank you. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. Hope you're all doing well.